Hi. Hi. Um, I want to start by asking you guys a question. How many of you have had to fill out some sort of web form where you've had to read distorted characters like this one? <laughs> Excellent. How many of you found it really annoying? Excellent. OK, well, I invented that. Um, <laughs> I was one of the people who invented that. That thing is called a CAPTCHA. And the reason is there is to make sure that you, the entity filling out the form, are actually a human and not a computer program that was written to submit the form millions of times. And the reason it works is because humans, at least non-visually impaired humans, uh, can read these characters, whereas computer programs can't do it as well yet. So for example, in the case of Ticketmaster, the reason you have to type these is to prevent scalpers from writing a program that can buy millions of tickets two at a time. <laughs> now these are used all over the internet. And at some point, I've, I found that approximately 200 million times a day, somebody types one of these around the world. Now, when I first heard this number, I was really proud of myself. I thought, look at the impact that my research has had. Uh, but then I started feeling bad, because the thing is, not only are these very annoying, uh, but also, each time you type one of these, you waste about 10 seconds of your time. And if you multiply 10 seconds by 200 million, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting about 500,000 hours every day typing these annoying captures <laughs> because of me. Uh, so, I started, so I started feeling bad. Um, and then I started thinking, is there any way in which we can use this effort for something that is useful for humanity? And the answer to that is yes. And it turns out, um, uh, what you may not know is that nowadays, while you're typing a CAPTCHA, not only are you authenticating yourself as a human, but also you're helping us to digitize books. Okay, so let me explain how that works. So there's a lot of projects out there trying to digitize books. For example, Google has one. Uh, the Internet Archive has another one. Um, and the basic idea is to take all the books that, were, that have ever been written and put them in digital form over the Internet. Now, uh, the way this process works is you start with a, with a physical book. You've seen those things, right? Like a, like a book. You start one of those. Uh, and then you scan it. Uh, now, scanning a book, literally what it is, is taking a digital photograph of every page of the book. The next step in the process is that the computer needs to be able to decipher all of the words in, in these pictures. Uh, but for older books where the ink has faded, the computer cannot recognize a lot of the words. Uh, but humans can. So what we're doing now is we're taking all of the words that the computer cannot recognize in this book digitization process, and we're getting people to read them for us while they type a CAPTCHA on the internet. Okay, so next time you type one of these, thank you. Uh, so next time you type one of these, um, you're basically, these words are words that are coming directly from a book that has been scanned that the computer could not recognize, and we're getting people to read them for us. Uh, so that the computer can recognize them. So this is, this is the process that we're using. Um, it's, it's been very successful. So we're digitizing approximately 100 million words per day, which is the equivalent of about 2 million books a year, all being done one word at a time by just people typing CAPTCHAs on the internet. Uh, now, this is a project that I did. Um, I, I talk about this project. I'm, I'm going to talk about my current project, which is something called Duolingo. Um, I talk about this project because this is, this is, in some sense, what led to Duolingo. It was um, about. Uh, I, did, th th I did this project of the book digitization with the CAPTCHAs at, at, in a, the year around 2007. Um, and we were digitizing all kinds of things, like old editions of the New York Times, et cetera. And in about the year 2009, um, we actually sold it to Google. Uh, and after that, I decided to dedicate, well, I, first I took, like, I retired for, like, a day. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then I decided to, to start working on, on my true passion, because uh, at that point, I didn't really need to support myself anymore. So I decided to work on, on my true passion, which has always been education. Um, I, am a, I am also a computer science professor, so my passion has always been education. But, um, and I decided to work on this system called Duolingo, uh, which is a free way to learn languages. And this is what Duolingo is. It's a website, it's an app, et cetera. It's a free way to learn languages. Now, my views on education, when we started, um, my views on education have always been very influenced by where I'm from. I am from Guatemala. This is a public service announcement that is where Guatemala is. <laughs> uh, and this is very important. This is, this is not where they keep the prisoners. That is called Guantanamo. <laughs> Different. Now, the thing about Guatemala is it's a very poor country. Uh, and a lot of people say that education is something that brings equality to different social classes. Uh, that's what people say. But I always saw it as, uh, as the opposite, as the complete opposite in practice. What, what seems to happen in practice is that the people who have a lot of money are able to buy themselves the best education in the world, and they can go to Harvard, et cetera. And because they have such great education, they continue having a lot of money. Whereas the people who don't have very much money barely learn how to read and write. And because of that, they never are able to make a lot of money. 
And so it's this thing that creates a huge disparity between the different social classes. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to work on something that would bring equal access to education to everybody, regardless of whether they had a lot of money or not. This is what I wanted to do. Now, education, of course, is very general, and my brain just doesn't work that way, so I decided to work on one type of education at first. Uh, and it is something that is very popular all over the world, and it is learning a foreign language. It's very popular all over the world, except in the US, it turns out. People really don't want to learn a foreign language. Uh, but there's about 1.2 billion people in the world learning a foreign language. Now, this is a very strange market. Um, out of these 1.2 billion people, the majority of them, 800 million of them, satisfy three properties. First, they're learning English. Second, the reason they're learning English is in order to get a job. And third, they are of low socioeconomic condition. Okay, so most people learning a foreign language are basically trying to get out of poverty by learning English. This is the language learning market in the world. Now, ironically, most of the ways there are to learn a language, especially with software, were very expensive. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S., there's this thing called Rosetta Stone. It's between $500 and $1,000. Uh, in Latin America, there's their own version. There's this thing called Open English, which is about $1,000. Uh, so, the, it, this is the irony. It seems that most people that are trying to learn a language are trying to do so to get out of poverty, but in order to get out of poverty, you need $1,000. Doesn't work out. Uh, so, what I wanted to do was to make a completely free way to learn languages. That, and that's what we did. And so, about Three or so, three and a half years ago, we launched this thing called Duolingo. Uh, and ever since we launched it, it has grown a lot. And today, Duolingo is the most popular way to learn languages in the world. Um, so for example, here's this, I, I really like this graph. This is the number of, the, the volume of Google searches in, between Rosetta Stone and Duolingo. Now, here's the thing. Rosetta Stone spends $200 million a year on ads, trying to convince everybody that they should learn a language. With Duolingo, we spend zero. Uh, and it is significantly more popular. There are actually more people learning a language on Duolingo in the United States than there are people learning languages in the whole U.S. public school system. So it, it's, it's, it's very popular. And, it's, and the types of things that people say are, are, are very positive. For example, this person said in the past days they learned more from Duolingo than in a month of Rosetta Stone. Uh, or this other person. This was my mother. She likes it. Um, now, why is it that people like Duolingo so much? Why is it that it has grown so much? I mean, so one reason is because it's entirely free. This is great. Um, oh, and by the way, I, I should say this is something else. Um, one of the things that makes us most, most proud about Duolingo, I mean, it's, it's, it's used by over 110 million people, so it, it, that's, that's great. But one of the things that makes us most proud is it is used by really everybody in the spectrum uh, of kind of socioeconomic classes. So for example, uh, Duolingo is currently being used by um, all school kids in Colombia to learn English in, in the public schools in Colombia. Now, Colombia is a relatively poor country, and if you go to a public school in a country like Colombia, that means you're very poor. Because if you have any kind of money, your parents send you to a private school because the public school system is not very good. Uh, so we have basically public school kids in Colombia using Duolingo, and at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, Bill Gates, for example, has said that he uses Duolingo to learn a language. So we have the same tool uh, is being used by poor kids in developing countries as by the richest man in the world. And, and that is really what makes us the most proud because this, is, this really means more money cannot buy you a better education in some sense. I mean, of course, this is a very, very small segment of education, but this is what we would like to achieve. And so that's what makes us the most proud. Now, um, why is it that people like it so much? Um, and, and one of the reasons is because we've really worked hard to make Duolingo feel like you're playing a game. This is, this is important to us. Um, and it's because when you're learning something by yourself, anything, particularly learning a foreign language, but with anything, learning anything by yourself, one of the hardest things, probably the hardest thing, is to keep yourself motivated. It's just very hard. So what we've done is we've worked really hard to make Duolingo feel like you're playing a game. So for example, this is what the home screen of Duolingo looks like. Um, the basic idea is that we've split up a language into different units that we call skills. So for example, uh, food is a skill. That's where you learn all the food words or how to order in a restaurant. Uh, or plurals is a skill. That's where you learn how to pluralize, et cetera. And the idea is that at the beginning, only one of the skills is unlocked. And you have to complete that skill to unlock other skills. So you basically are unlocking this tree of skills. Uh, and it's, it's a very gamified um, idea. Um, also, and the idea, the way you unlock something is in, in a given skill, uh, there's, there's multiple lessons, and each lesson is basically composed of these 
very quick, about 30 second exercises that teach you something. And in these exercises, you can do all kinds of things. So for example, you may get to translate something, or you may get to just pick the right image for, that, that relates to the word, or you may get to speak to the app and it tells you whether you said it correctly or not. So you're doing these 30 second little exercises. And the idea is that whenever you get one of these exercises correct, your progress bar goes up. Whenever you get it wrong, your progress bar goes down. And that's the idea. At the beginning, this progress bar starts empty, and the more exercises you get correct, the more it fills up until it's fully done, and then you finish the lesson. That's the basic idea. Now, this progress bar actually is a pretty sophisticated piece of machinery. Um, we know how difficult each of the exercises is, and for very difficult exercises, if you get them correct, the progress bar goes up a lot. Uh, but for very difficult exercises also, if you get them wrong, the progress bar does not go down very much because anyways, we kind of expected you to get them wrong. <laughs> so that's the idea. So this, this progress bar really takes into account how difficult each of the exercises is. Um, and we've also worked really hard to try to tweak everything in the user interface and everywhere to keep Duolingo as engaging as possible. So let me just give you an example. Um, this is something, so Duolingo used to look more like this, and now it looks more like this. I will highlight the difference. This changed. Uh, and this is something that we found through a lot of testing. It used to be the case that Duolingo, a lesson consisted of 20, 20 exercises. That was a lesson, and each time you got an exercise wrong, you would lose a heart. You had three hearts. And whenever you lost all three hearts, you basically had to start over. We call that you died. Uh, <laughs> and you had to start over. And that, so that's how it used to work. Um, we, we started experimenting with this other way of working, which is how it now works, where it's basically this progress bar that goes up and down, depending on whether you things, get things correctly or not. We tested this with a, the way we, we launched this, which tested this, this new way of doing it with a small fraction of our users, and we found that actually this new progress bar gets people to do 5% more lessons. Now, 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but we're doing hundreds of these different changes, and so this 5% adds up, because it's 5% here, 2% there, another 10% here, and over time, Duolingo literally is getting more fun. Um, and we've basically tried to tweak everything with how, and another thing that we do, uh, this, is, this is actually a, a pretty, uh, I find it pretty interesting. How many of you have played Candy Crush? You can tell the truth. <laughs> Okay, do, how many of you have seen Candy Crush or been played by your friend or cousin? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing with Candy Crush. Um, Candy Crush is a very fun game. If you haven't played it, I strongly recommend it. It's a very fun game. Um, the thing with Candy Crush is it's not a very innovative game in some sense. It is, a, it, it is a very similar game to other games that existed before. They're called Threes games. They're very similar. The idea is that you get this matrix of candies and you just have to find kind of triples of them. And wherever you find them, you kind of tap them and then good things happen, candies disappear, and then you get a new row of candies at the top. That's basically it. Now, all previous versions of these games were not as popular as Candy Crush. All of them got to about a million users. That's what they would get. Candy Crush got to hundreds of millions of users. And one of the biggest differences between Candy Crush and the previous games that were very similar to Candy Crush is that this row at the top that you get, the new row of candies that you get at the top, seems entirely random. And in previous games, it was random. In Candy Crush, this row is not random. This row has entirely been designed, statistically, to make it so that you're gonna play another round. Because you get things that, you get things that are just extremely motivating, like things that seem hard, but actually weren't, or almost things. That really gets you to play, and this, is, this actually is based on the same fundamental principle as slot machines. You know, in slot machines, uh, they're, they're a little tweaked in that, for example, in, you know, the, the three of a kind slot machines, the, the, the one where you get two out of three is significantly more likely than it should be. Because whenever you get one of those, you think, oh man, I'm very close, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> and so that's exactly the same principle that Candy Crushes uses. And by the way, we use exactly that same principle with Duolingo. We actually pick the exercises in such a way that they are essentially there to keep you addicted. We do things, we know how hard each exercise is, and we do things, we know, you know, when, whenever, whenever we know that you're getting very frustrated, we give you easy things, or, when, or we give you things that may seem difficult, but actually are easy, and that's very motivating. And so we pick the exercise sequences in such a way as to keep you more addicted. Uh, so we do a lot of these tricks, and that, that's why, basically, we, we get a lot of users. 
Now, in terms of educational efficacy, you know, when we, when we started with Duolingo about four years ago, my, my co-founder and I, we're both computer scientists. My co-founder has an amazing name. His name is Severin, and his last name is Hacker. And <laughs> when I met him, I said, you're hired. Uh, um, he, he and I didn't know anything about how to teach languages. We're, we just knew computer science. Uh, so when we started, we decided to go read a bunch of books on how to best teach languages. We literally, we literally read French for Dummies and a bunch of other books. At some point, he found a, a book that I thought was really good. It had, I don't remember the actual title, but it was something like the best proven method to learn languages. And we read the book, and it had a method to learn languages, and it had some evidence that it was really the best way to learn languages. As soon as we read that, we thought, we're done. This is it. We're just going to copy this method, and that's it. This is Duolingo is going to be the best method to learn a language in the world. Unfortunately, uh, we kept on digging, and we found other books that also claimed to have the best method to learn languages, but unfortunately, they were entirely different than the first one. And so we started thinking, hmm, these books are very similar to books on diets. If you've ever read those, they all contradict each other, and they all claim, you know, you should always eat meat, you should never eat meat, who knows which one's correct. It felt like that for languages. Uh, so what we did, we, you know, we got very confused, and we were, of course, we were two engineers trying to come up with the best way to teach languages, and we just wanted, we were, we didn't particularly care about philosophy. We didn't know whether, you know, we didn't care about all these philosophies. We just not, wanted to know very specific, simple questions, like, should we teach plurals before adjectives? This is a very simple question. It turns out the books contradicted each other. Nobody really knew. And so what we did is we launched what we could. I mean, we kind of read the books and kind of took the majority vote for most things, and we, we launched that. Uh, and then we quickly realized we we're actually in a very fortunate position. Once Duolingo started growing, we realized we had enough users that we could actually figure out the answer to most of these questions by ourselves through Duolingo. So for example, if we want to know whether we should teach plurals before adjectives, we just do a study within Duolingo users. We do an A-B test. So the basic idea is for the next 50,000 users that sign up, we're gonna, for half of them, we teach them plurals before adjectives. The other half, we teach them adjectives before plurals. And then we measure which ones learn better. So we measure which, which ones make less mistakes, which ones stick around for longer, et cetera, and we can find out once and for all whether it's better to teach plurals before adjectives or adjectives before plurals. And this is just, of course, kind of a fake example. I mean, we, we do this for hundreds of different concepts, and sometimes it's just very tiny things, just for a single word, how early should we teach it, and sometimes it's for entire big concepts. And because of that, Duolingo has gotten significantly better over time, uh, and kind of the latest numbers, and this actually is, is from a little while ago, but Turns out um, the City University of New York did a little study, and they found that if you use Duolingo for 34 hours, you learn the equivalent of one semester of college education in that language. And it's all because, um, you know, we're essentially just improving over time through our data. Now, that, that was the study, and, and they decided to compare Duolingo with a classroom, but actually our, the way we view things is not to compare Duolingo against the classroom. We, in fact, would like to use Duolingo with the classroom. This is how we think it's the best way to use it. So, you know, the way, what we think is Duolingo is pretty good, teachers are pretty good, but Duolingo plus teachers should be better. And that's kind of how we see things. Um, and about a year ago, we started, um, we started working on trying to get Duolingo also being used by schools. Most of the usage of Duolingo was outside of schools. It was all being done just by kids by themselves. Um, and about a year ago, we started trying to push for Duolingo being used in schools. Today, Duolingo is used in over 100,000 classrooms throughout the world uh, in all kinds of different capacities. Some teachers use it for extra credit. Some teachers use it for, you know, the students that finish the activities early in class, they just say, okay, now you go, should go use Duolingo in your extra time. Uh, some people change their, some teachers change their whole curriculum to follow Duolingo's curriculum. Uh, and so it's, it's being used all over the place throughout uh, in that way. A lot of it is internationally. Um, I would say usually, for most metrics to our, of our users, 20% is US, 80% is the rest of the world. Um, so it's Duolingo in schools. And the last thing that I want to talk about related to Duolingo is something else that we uh, launched about, we launched this about a year and a half ago. Um, and it, it, it started as follows. Um, we started getting a bunch of emails from people telling us, um, mainly people learning English. They would tell us, thank you for Duolingo, I'm now able to learn English for free. I wasn't able to afford it before, but now I have a problem. I need to certify that I know English in order to 
uh, be able to apply for a job, be able to apply for a university, get admitted to whatever, etc. They needed a certificate to show that they knew English. Um, we started getting a lot of those emails and then we started investigating uh, this whole market of basically certifying that you know English. Uh, and what we found was pretty crazy. First of all, this is a humongous market. Turns out about $15 billion a year are spent on certifying that people know English. Uh, and it is used for all kinds of reasons. For example, um, if you want to apply to a US university from a non-English speaking country, you have to take a test that certifies that you know English. If you want to get a work visa in the US and you're from a non-English speaking country, you have to take a test that certifies that you know English. If you want to uh, work at a multinational corporation, you have to take the, a test that shows that you know English. Uh, so there's all kinds of reasons. And usually the way people certify that they know English is they have to take a standardized test. That's usually what they have to do. Now, there's a few of these tests. One of them is called the TOEFL. It's done by ETS. Uh, there's uh, other ones. There's one called the IELTS, et cetera. But they're all very similar to each other. Basically, they all cost about $250 that the student pays or whoever you know, the, the end consumer pays, $250. Um, you usually have to go to a testing center to take the test. This is important. That, that the reason you have to do that is to prove that you, you're not cheating. Uh, so you have to go to a testing center to take the test. And because you have to go to a testing center to take the test, you have to make an appointment, usually about four weeks in advance. Uh, and then you go there, you take the test, and then you get your results about another four weeks later. So the whole process takes about eight weeks, costs $250, so you have to travel somewhere to take the test. Now, this sounds annoying, because it is. Uh, but it's actually way worse than that, because what happens is most of the people that have to take a test to certify that they know English are in developing countries. Now there, this is a completely different equation. $250 is a month's salary. The testing center, they're not in every city. So you usually have to travel to a different city and you have to wait eight weeks. So the, for the mere fact that you need to certify that you know English, you have to spend a month's salary, travel to a different city, and wait eight weeks for the whole process. Uh, we think this is kind of ridiculous, especially since administering one of these tests literally costs $10. So I don't know where these $240 go. Well, I, I kind of do, but <laughs> they go somewhere. Um, so what we decided to do is we decided to, well, do something about that. So we launched our own version of an English certificate about a year ago. Um, so the Duolingo certificate, it costs $20. I will tell you why it costs money, but it costs $20 um, instead of $250. The reason it costs money is because, see, we have to certify that you didn't cheat. And the way we, oh, by the way, the other thing is you take the, you don't have to go to a testing center, you take it from your own phone, from your own mobile device. Now, the question is, how do we certify that you didn't cheat? That is, that you didn't get your cousin to take the test for you or that you didn't have you know, Google in front of you and didn't Google all the answers. Uh, and the way we certify that you didn't cheat is we actually turn on the front-facing camera of your phone and your microphone and we actually record you taking the test. And then later, a real human proctor watches you taking the test. And then we can figure out whether you cheated or not. And it turns out it's very easy to spot people cheating. I will tell you what cheating looks like. Cheating looks like this. <laughs> That's what cheating looks like. It's pretty easy to uh, spot that. Um, and so we, so we launched that, and, and it's, it's, it's been going pretty well. Um, the, the, the hardest part now, I, I think technologically we're done with this, the hardest part now is to try to get our test essentially accepted by all the institutions that accept these other more expensive tests. And we're, we're, we're doing pretty well with that. Um, some departments of Harvard, Harvard University are already accepting our tests. Some departments of Carnegie Mellon University already accept our tests. And this coming year, 12 very well-known US universities that I'm sure you've heard of, like Yale, Columbia, uh, et cetera, uh, will, uh, will be requiring all their international applicants to take both the Duolingo test and the TOEFL. And we're giving away the Duolingo test for free for this. Uh, and the idea is that what they're doing is they're going to try to um, uh, measure the correlation between the TOEFL and our test. And if it's high enough, then they're going to start accepting our test in lieu of the TOEFL. Uh, and that's what we want to do. So good. So that's, and if, if the only thing we're able to achieve with this is that the TOEFL people lower their price to $20, then it will have been a win. <laughs> uh, I, hopefully that, that's what will happen. Um, so uh, that's it. That's all I have to say. And I think I have time. Basically, you guys should ask questions. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, I will go to sleep because I am from the East Coast. <laughs> but you guys can ask questions.